change your Zoom setting to everyone. Great. Okay, so let's dive right in. Um, I'm super excited to have here um, two incredible panelists on our uh, webinar on designing modern workplace policies. Um, I'll uh, let each of you uh, introduce yourselves. Um, Brandon, I'll start with you. Thanks, Lisa. Hey, everyone. I'm Brandon Samut, the Chief People Officer at Zapier. Uh, Zapier is a workflow automation product that uh, makes it easy uh, for folks to focus on the things that humans do best, and we abstract a lot of the rest away. Uh, Zapier is 12 years old. It's an all-remote company. Uh, I work from a home office in Berkeley, California. Amazing. Yes. Awesome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Great to be here with everybody. Um, so my name is Jess Swank, pronoun she, her. I am a chief people, but also people and communities um, officer here at Box. And Box is a content management SaaS uh, global organization. We're about 2,600 uh, folks around the world, and we are a hybrid, flexible uh approach. So we'll have some interesting uh, conversation hopefully today about uh, hearing both the remote and also hybrid. Amazing. Um, and hello, everyone. I'm Lisa. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Gable. I'll show you in a, in a few slides um, what, what Gable is all about. Um, but while everyone's joining, I uh, wanted to kick it off with an interesting question, I would say. Uh, what was your first job and um what maybe what did you learn from it uh, Jess can we start with you yeah well my first actual real job was um babysitting so I started babysitting when I was 11 <laughs> my first official job actually was um at um Silk Row Fabrics it was a fabric store and I was 14 and I got a special work permit uh to be able to to work and I literally just helped um folks and so I think early on I just have been very much into the like hey how do we um how do we create and how do we create in all that we do and how do we really think about service in a way uh from every interaction so I've been uh, interested in that from the very early days amazing Brandon how about you um, my first job, gosh, I must have been 12, 13 years old. I uh, I mowed lawns uh, in and around <laughs> my neighborhood and lots of lessons there. I mean, one is like, you, you know, you're knocking on doors, you know, asking for business and just being able to like put out your offer and then be quiet for a minute and let the other person think about it and give you a response like that pause moment when you're making an ask is, was a big learning. And the second was, you know, like a lot of things in life, like half the battle is just doing what you say you are going to do, right? Let's just like consistent follow through, show up on time, do a good job, right? Um, and uh, that uh, that really is a big part of, uh, you know, everything that, that I think a lot of us get involved with. What a good lesson at the age of 12, I feel like, like right? Quite amazing. Um, my first job was actually at a pizza place. I started literally like from the bottom, like cleaning, doing, you know, small tasks and then grew there at the end. Like I managed um, half of the half of the pizza place, which was really funny. But I think the 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 biggest thing is is brand to your point is just like one is in a sense customer service, right? How do you handle with very different types of people that you you need to learn how to how to respond? And and the second I would say is actually great just perseverance uh, in, you know, tactic work environment. Um, so I think those those were the two lessons that I've learned from that. Um, great. Let's um, dive right in. Um, so a little bit about Gable, um, really our vision and what, what we are strive, what we strive to do as a company is create a, a workplace policy uh, enablement platform to really reimagine how teams um, structure their modern workplace. Um, we provide employees the ability to work from anywhere, from our marketplace component, but also to have one single holistic um, platform to manage anything related to your flex or dedicated office, and in general, all of your workplace strategy. Um, let's dive right into a few interesting stats and workplace policy. 
So you can see here, this is a very interesting bell curve. We just put a few few um, companies here. Um, I know that you know, right now, basically, I think the, the consensus is that there is no consensus. There is no one size fits all for companies, which I think is quite interesting just to see it here. And even, you know, Jess, Brandon, you're also, I would say, in a different different aspects uh, on the bell curve, I would say. Brandon, I think, you know, Zephyr is much more to the remote first, fully remote, and Jess, you're more on the hybrid first approach, I would say. Um, so I wanted just to kick us off with, if each of you can share, what does it mean? Your fully remote or remote first and hybrid uh, initiative. Um, Jess, I'll start with you. Yeah, no, yeah, I, and I, I just echo what you said, right? I don't think there one size does not fit all, and I think every company has. To, we're all figuring this out, so I think it's the uh, my meta theme is like, hey, we're all on this journey together. So um, <laughs> we're all on this bell curve together. Yeah, I'm absolutely, I'm figuring this out. So we at Box, um, before the pandemic, we were kind of fully in office, um, and we have moved to I would say more of a hybrid. So we have set where. Uh, two days a week. So Tuesdays and Thursdays are the days that we've identified. Because again, we try and think about it like three different levels, one at a company level, and then at a team level, and then at an individual level. So at a company level, we really want, we want people to be able to come and collaborate and create that community. And yet we also want teams to be able to be most effective. So having managing global teams, we know that not every team um, needs to and wants to operate the same but also flexibility at the individual level. We believe, I believe very strongly that that is paramount for success, right? I think many of us got used to working from home and many of us have very dynamic lives. And so we want to have our, what we call our boxers, our boxers be able to thrive both professionally and personally. And yet we want to be able to, again, create that, I, I call it planting the seeds for serendipity being able to create those opportunities where if you come together, you're able to make the most out of the, the time and the, the community and connection. But we're very focused on whether you're fully remote, because we do have a number of boxers and particular roles and or, you know, because they, you know, talent or another reason they are remote or we hybrid or fully in office. We want no matter where you're working and whatever your situation is for you to be able to be successful. Brenda. Well, first, I just want to uh, plus one what Jess was sharing that, you know, none of these models are a perfect fit for every company. And uh, Zapier's model, which is all remote, is not only not the best match for every person, it's actually not the best match for every company. In fact, there are lots of companies out there that are probably really struggle uh, doing all remote. Um, it happens to be a good match for Zapier, uh, which we could talk about later. But what does it mean? So all remote at Zapier simply means that uh, folks can work from anywhere they are authorized to work in the world. So we don't do, you know, um, like immigration visas or other forms of visas, um, but anywhere someone can work and meet their job responsibilities, they're able to do that. What that also means is that we don't have any offices, not a single square foot of office space. Um, so again, we have about 800 people today and together they live in about 40 countries. Wow, amazing. Um, well, we'll talk about both of these models in length in a second as well. So very interesting. So let's start, uh, you know, shift gears with a poll. Um, what's your current, for the audience, what's your current workplace strategy? We'll give it five more seconds. Okay. Okay, can we see the results? Okay. Great. Oh, can everyone see this? Well, definitely, we see the bell curve in uh, in in uh, full fledged. Some something less surprising. We see, you know, quite a lot of companies fully remote. Um, the key moments is also very interesting. 
um, aspect. Just I think you're probably you have a bit of a combination, right? It's like fully you have some employees fully remote, some hybrid, some hybrid with specific days. Um, and it's very interesting how everyone is, you know, carving their own policy in a sense. Uh, and we're still deciding, uh, which is very um, top of mind, I would say. Cool. Okay. Um, wanted to share a few, you know, as a, as a data person, I think it's super interesting to see again um, what the organization policy. It, it's pretty much aligned with what we've seen here, um, you know, more or less. Um, this is a recent um, data that just came out um, from BCG that again shows this very interesting uh, bell curve here um, and it again shows just how much does this evolve over time. Um, let's uh, continue with another poll. Uh, what's your biggest challenge with those policies? Okay, let's close the poll. Oh, so interesting. Number one is building culture, actually. Um, so dear panelists, what do you think on the challenges that are presented here? How, how do you relate? What do you see? Um, coming into play, uh, given you have quite different policies, I would say. Um, Brennan, let's start with you. Sure. Um, I wasn't necessarily surprised to see building culture as almost 50% uh, of the responses. And, you know, one thing um, we think a lot about at Zapier is like, what do we mean when we say culture? Because it's such a common thing. And, you know, you can get you know, 10 people in a room and kind of they can all agree that like building culture can be really challenging, uh, maybe particularly in a distributed model. But if you then ask that same group of 10 people to write down what they mean by culture, you could get 10 different answers. And so, you know, um, you know, an encouragement, you know, that I'd offer is um, when you're talking about culture with your teams and like usually when you're pointing at that and saying, hey, that's challenging right now, like you're pointing at something, right? Culture can mean a lot of different things, though. So, you know, get a couple layers deeper with your team. You mean culture as it relates to or we're not aligned, for example, on how we get work done, right? Because culture, right? One definition of culture is it's the norms and just kind of like uh, sometimes unsaid expectations around how we do things as a team. So maybe that's it. Maybe when folks are talking about culture, they're talking a little bit more about relationships and this notion that like it's a little bit of an isolating experience to work at this company right now. Or they might say um, uh, it's actually a little bit more about connection to the mission and the customer. It's like we're just kind of losing it, right? Like we don't feel really like we really understand what we're doing or who we're doing it for. That's a really great point, actually. Just the definition of what is a culture, I think, is a very, very interesting piece. Um, and maybe if you can share, do you see any of those challenges uh, right now at Zapier in terms of any of those isolation, building culture, well-being? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think we actually see all of them. And what's interesting is when we ask why, um, at least at least in Zapier's case, and I can explain why I think this is true in a moment, um, that none of them are uh, the root cause for, for any of them actually doesn't necessarily relate to the remote model. So take um, like uh, culture defined as being somewhat misaligned on how we get work done at the company. Well, what is that a symptom of? Well, as we understand it, it's partly a symptom that we doubled the size of the team in 18 months, right? So you're bringing a lot of fresh people into the company and you're trying to like, you know, be really cohesive, right? And do a great job with ramping people up and, and normalizing folks into how work gets done at the company. And then the second thing is when you double in size, actually some of the ways that you get work done needs to actually change. So you're, you're trying to align on a moving target. So in, in many ways, that's actually the root cause for that first uh, kind of culture challenge. And then just to list a second one of the three that I, I shared earlier, on the uh, connection to mission and the customer, there too, like for us, our root cause uh, for that particular culture challenge is more around just communication. Right at the end of the day, whether we were all in the office or not, we don't, we're, we're a software company. And so we don't, 
regularly have, and we don't sell in a traditional like in-person sales motion. And so even if all of our people were in a single office, we still wouldn't be seeing customers in person every day. And so we have to, we've had to create rituals and moments to actually give our customers the microphone to get them on stage, you know, virtually, of course, um, to talk a little bit about how they use Zapier, what their pain points are, what their feedback is for us. And interestingly, there too, again, like less about the uh, workplace model and more about um, kind of communication and how we center customers in the work that we do. Amazing. Um, Jess, how about you? What are um, maybe what was something surprising in terms of the, the challenges that were surveyed? Uh, or which one of them do you relate as part of, you know, what you see at the box? Yeah, I think uh, similar to Brandon, I think we can relate to and see all of these, right? Because we have people working across um, all the spectrum. And I would say a couple of points that are maybe more wrappers to all of these challenges is one, we talk a lot around how do we create, you know, think about equity versus equality and that though, though not everybody's experience is going to be the same, but how do we make sure and try our best that we are, you know, have similar types of ability to be successful, to have experiences, to have that connection no matter where you are. Because I think uh, for those folks who are in office together and working, uh, how do we also make sure that the global teams are feeling included and in that communication and that, you know, knowledge sharing and management. I would say one of the other, you know, challenges across all these for us is just, wow, this just takes a lot of investment. And so, you know, our biggest request is people, teams want to get together more. They want to fly around the world and come together and have events uh, and that costs a lot of money. And so I don't know about other companies and all of you, but I know we're having to also be very thoughtful about every single dollar we spend. So I would say that is one of the, the wrapper challenges that we're experiencing yeah. firsthand. Super interesting. And one data point I wanted to share uh, from a fresh survey, actually, is the perceived challenges on in-office versus remote, actually. Um, and I think that the most, at least for me, the, the data point that um, was so astonishing is, the, is how managers um, see remote productivity mm -hmm. versus employees. Um, and you can see it very clearly um, here. So I wanted to get your thoughts uh, on, you know, this information. Do you, is it something that you, that, uh, you know, managers are talking about, you know, different initiatives that they, they want to make sure that the employees are productive or even how do you measure productivity, I would say. Um, Brendan, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. So uh, Lisa, you, you got my eyes focused on the uh, chart on the far right. And I'm looking at yeah. uh, the bottom, uh, the bottom two, like equally productive as an office, more productive as an office. And there you see like the biggest perception difference between employees and their managers. And, um, you know, one, one hunch I have about that difference is frame of reference. So if I'm an employee filling out a survey like this, I'm, I'm thinking about myself, like how, how productive do I think I am? Remote, you know, versus in the office. And, you know, clearly you can see here a lot of, a lot of employees, uh, would say that uh, I, I might even be more productive than in the office. Maybe I'm thinking about the fact that I, I didn't have to commute that day, so I actually worked more hours. I actually had more time to actually work um, or fewer distractions or something like that. So frame of reference is on my own personal productivity. You know, as the manager, to your, to your other question, Lisa, I'm, I'm probably trying to think about my team's productivity. And interestingly, like if you, you know, the, the honest truth is we ask a lot of managers and even some very well-known companies, how they measure productivity for their team. Some team, some managers are going to have a really crisp answer to that question and others aren't going to be super sure how to quantify yeah. that. So they're, they're trying to, you know, kind of, you know, form a perception on something that may not be super quantifiable. And then the other thing that might be going on with manager perception is they might be thinking not just about the productivity, they might be thinking about company performance. Like if I don't have a really quantifiable way to measure my team's productivity, what's my next best proxy? It's kind of like, is the company performing? How are we doing? And um, this is fresh survey data from July, if I'm looking at the bottom left-hand corner correctly. And, you know, a lot of companies right now are finding their way. You know, um, some companies are hitting their targets um, and many are not. 
uh, right now because of some unevenness in the economy and, and hard to predict what's going to happen over the next year or two. And so managers just might be thinking also about company performance. And if that's mixed, then their perception of the productivity of their people, unless they have really good ways to quantify it for their team specifically, that might be influencing the results here. Jess, any other thoughts? Yeah, I will also kind of build on a theme that I think Brandon was starting to talk about is I think productivity, how um, I actually don't like the conversation around productivity, honestly, because I think productivity, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like culture, it's impossible to measure. And I think to me, yes, you can measure productivity of like, oh, how many emails you sent or, you know, something like that. But I think thinking about it, what is short term productivity versus long term productivity? Um, I think productivity, as Brandon was saying, at the company level versus the team level versus the individual level can can shift yeah. quite a bit. And so I think I would love to have us think, you know, reframe the conversation and not have it be about, you know, kind of widget of productivity, but really about wellness and how do we thrive again, both as companies, but also as individuals and, and that integration of sometimes the short term productivity and I need to be productive at home because I have something else going on. But sometimes then I need to go and be focused and productive, you know, uh, sitting in a room and in an office with my peers and my teammates. So I think, again, I think I would love to for all of us to change the conversation and to think a little bit more holistically. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think one of actually a question to both of you in terms of, um, you know, your workplace strategy are a little bit different. And I wonder what were the inputs or data points that you took in order to shape this workplace strategy, um, whether those are specific metrics that you're looking at, whether, um, you know, those are employee feedback, how, how you know, how did this workplace strategy uh, came about? And then, you know, how do you continue to evolve it over time? Those are, you know, two, two separate questions. I'll start with Jess. Yeah, so great question. Uh, so I think uh, for Box, a lot of it was uh, based on kind of pre-pandemic, as I mentioned, we were very much an in-office culture. And I would say our, our CEO, some of our co-founders, they kind of grew up that way and they, they love that, right? Having our product folks, our engineering, our product marketing folks sitting side by side, you know, doing the whiteboard, the daily stand-ups. Um, every day. So I think that's where we came from. And so I think what we're looking at as we're evolving and continuing to kind of test and pilot and learn and adjust is uh, we do have an annual what we call our boxer experience survey where we do think about where we ask a lot of targeted questions. We've also done some targeted surveys, again, just thinking about, you know, what is again, best for the individuals, but also then how do we make that work collectively as a whole. And what we've really found is, again, flexibility was one that seemed that, you know, kind of continues to come through is important, as well mm -hmm. as, though, again, going back to that sense of we continue to hear of, hey, I don't want to come into the office and then sit by myself or sit on a Zoom call. So what we are trying to do, too, is to think about, OK, how do we how do we provide some um, just thoughts on structuring one day differently if you are going to be hybrid? How does that look like in terms of, you know, team meetings, right? We've been, again, piloting a lot. We, uh, during the pandemic, we, we have uh, what we call Friday lunch every single week where we come together as a whole company and talk about the week. We we're, have had such success of that globally, virtually, that we're gonna, we are continuing that to be virtual. So we're also looking at individually what meetings, what events, what does this look like and how is it going to work best? So. Uh, again, going back to our initial comment about that we're all on this learning journey and we're <laughs> testing and piloting and adjusting as, as as we go. I love also the, the iterative motion of it. I think it's very, very crucial. And I'm sure how you started is not how you are now. <laughs> and probably not where we're going to be, right? We're, we're, mm -hmm. we're in it. So. I love it. Um, Brendan, how about you? Yeah, I love the question. You know, in Zapier's case, we started all remote 12 years ago. Yeah. And the, the reason we did that um, was largely related to Zapier being a, a tiny startup that nobody had heard of at a fairly hot time in the talent market you know, in the Bay Area and many other places. And 
you know, uh, Zapier's three co-founders um, were from the the Midwest region of the United States, and you know they they knew that you know talent is pretty equally distributed. Um, opportunity usually isn't, and they said, hey, if we were really want to like be able to like find great folks as a small company that nobody knows, maybe we should start remote. And a lot of folks told them, you know, don't do that. Like you can't build a company that way. And um, they just had a lot of conviction that this could work. And, and one of the big ideas is that we don't need this all remote model to be the best match for every person. We're hiring one person, then five people, then 50 people, right? The talent market, even for fairly specialized things, is just bigger than that. And we just need to find folks that are a great match who are really inclined uh, to this all remote model. And those are the folks we're going to hire into the company. And so that's what Zapier has been do doing 12 years running. Uh, but like Jess was sharing, just because Zapier has been consistent in the all remote model doesn't mean we haven't had to evolve how it works as the company's gotten bigger. And we most certainly have. Um, part of the inputs we use to figure out like, like when and how to do that is based in part on what we're trying to do as a business. So before we start looking at like, you know, uh, employee surveys or talking talent strategy, the very first thing we're thinking about is how is what we're trying to do as a business changing how are our goals changing? And like, what are, you know, what are our, our hunches or hypotheses about where our current way of working is going to break, right? And where we need to make a change. And just maybe as a follow-up to that, how do you see like the business strategy influence the workplace strategy at the box? Just on Sorry, sorry. Um, so I think we really think about what is, as Brandon was saying, was really, like, where is the business going and what is that strategy, which is also why, you know, we um, really try and align on, you know, the, the business, but also our customers. So one of our values um, is blow your customers' minds. And we really try and think about where and how do we meet the customers where, where they are. So part of that's part of our distributed and our global organization. Uh, we also actually right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, started opening a site in Warsaw, Poland. And so that has also been an interesting dynamic of building out, you know, both a new office and a new uh, location. And I think too, uh, one of, uh, I think it's easy to focus on just the hybrid, but it's also, I think being a global organization, a lot of these challenges, they're not new challenges, right? I know in my previous days, it was a lot of the same when you, you know, are managing a, a distributed organization or a distributed team, you know, finding even one time when you can all get on the same Zoom call, let alone meet yeah. in person is challenging, right? <laughs> so I think also a lot of these, it's just like, okay, how do we think about where the business is going? And then how do we align um, and not only the business, but also individual functions and teams uh, adjust. And so not, again, not one size fits all across, uh, across teams and across functions of all. And I want to actually touch on the, you know, not one size fits all. We see a lot, and I'm sure you've seen this on LinkedIn, that companies actually publish, publish externally, you know, what is their workplace strategy? Like you can see on LinkedIn companies that are fully remote, they, they say fully remote, hybrid, you know, runs the gamut. Um, how do how do you at, you know, at your companies communicate both externally and internally? on your policies and how you even roll them up. So um, I'll start with Jess. Yeah, so uh, a couple of things is one, um, you know, a, a product, shameless product plug. Um, so our product um, <laughs> actually um, helps induce and create, you know, being able to connect and collaborate around the world. And so we start with, you know, making sure that knowledge management, that sharing of information is able to uh, be done no matter where you are. Uh, the other one is we try and really kind of have a, um, a very thorough communication. We try to be very open and transparent about kind of where we are, what we're grappling with, where we might be going. Uh, we have rolled out uh, one, you know, we really believe also it starts with leadership. And so our CEO, myself, we try and really kind of just be very, again, transparent and open. So we mm -hmm. share that in Friday lunches at all hands. Uh, we sometimes have sent out, you know, kind of memos. We've done a lot of listening circles. We also have done a lot of manager enablement. So making sure our managers and leaders are understanding what the policies are or even just our approach, our philosophy um, 
So again, I think we're trying to do it in a, a variety of ways and then updates, questions, again, um, making sure that people know kind of where we are um, on our journey. So, but it's far from perfect, but we are certainly trying. <laughs> Brendan, how about you? I just build on what Jess said. I mean, Jess, you, you mentioned transparency and that's where it starts for us too. You know, again, like none of these models are a perfect match for every person, but if, uh, you know, whether it's Box or Zapier, if we're really transparent about, well, what is our model? And uh, why is it the way that it is? And how does it work? Like, what is it like, what does it look and feel like working here? And if we're able to be transparent about that internally, that's great, like really good documentation and examples, um, that's wonderful. Um, and um, we want uh, candidates who are interviewing to work at our companies to have that same level of transparency and context so that, you know, every hiring decision is a two-way decision. And we want folks to make a really informed decision about, you know, joining our companies, um, knowing not just what the job description is or the expectations for the job, but even just like the look and feel and what the workplace policy and model actually is. And um, I think that's really helpful because then folks are, you know, they're opting in right, to a very specific model. They're making a choice yeah. and they know exactly uh, what they're getting into. There's one other thing that we do at Zapier, which we found to be really important for helping folks ramp up in an all remote model, which is we just do a, an unusually thorough onboarding. An unusually Describe thorough. Describe what really, is that unusually yeah. thorough? What well, is it? It's really, it, it's really important, right? I mean, because, you know, over 90% of folks that join Zapier are joining their first all remote company. And so with that knowledge, it's like, okay, there's, you know, even when you onboard at a company whose workplace model you're already very familiar with, there's still so much to learn when you start a new job. And then you stack on top of that, coming into a company where more often than not, like the whole model is different than what you're used to. And so um, uh, for Zapier, the onboarding experience actually lasts, uh, goes all the way through the first six months. Now, it's not every day, 100% of your time is onboarding. It starts with like, you know, two weeks, which is effectively exclusively onboarding content. And then um, I'll, I'll actually match Jess with a product plug. Um, we use uh, Zapier automations to basically then like create these just-in-time learning moments or or kind of alignment moments over for folks for six months, you know, and, where, and some of that's time-based, like first 30 days, first 60 days. Some of it's milestone based, uh, based on certain like talent practices or cycles. And uh, we use those as opportunities to you know, kind of like continuously help folks um, kind of ramp up within the all remote model in their first six months. And yeah, and I'm just going to build really on that great. if I may. Yeah. The yes, onboarding. please. That's literally what I wanted to to ask. Perfect. Yeah. Is um. So I think at Box, so pre-pandemic, we actually had, we flew everybody into our Redwood City office for onboarding and post pandemic and during pandemic, right? We had to go all virtual. That is a good example of something that actually we found is so effective virtually that we are gonna continue that practice. But as Brandon said, uh, totally agree, have to make sure that it's incredibly thorough and we've had to adjust then, right? What that looks like and onboarding remotely is very different than onboarding in person. But then again, just kind of to iterate, we also, we have a couple of days, not a couple of weeks, but we have a couple of days where it's just fully focused. But then we have what we call our onboarding pathways, which are, you know, kind of ongoing in the six months. And so we make sure mm -hmm. that, you know, and everybody has an onboarding buddy. And so, again, I think that sense from, from even from recruiting all the way then through onboarding and then continuous at really key moments um, along the journey, continuing to reinforce it, reiterate uh, to make sure that everybody is, again, on the same page as best possible. That's phenomenal. And question, actually, you know, about challenges, I would say. So what, or, you know, might not, I, I wouldn't frame it as challenges, but may, maybe what are you tackling next in workplace strategy? What are your big items uh, for the rest of the year or things that you, you know, are top of mind for you in this workplace strategy? Um, Jess, we'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, one is we do have, as I mentioned, our physical offices. Uh, and so we are working. So we are, you know, for example, our Austin office, uh, we are revamping our space and we're going to have a opening here um, in the next couple of months. Uh, we have our new Warsaw office that we're opening. So I think just the physical places we're continuing to think about, again, that experience and making sure that the in-office experience is as great as possible. 
I mentioned it um, before, but one of our biggest challenges that we're still grappling with is people want to come together. They want to travel and we're just trying to balance what, you know, as we're thinking about our business and making sure that we're um, spending every single dollar as best as we can and the competing demands that we are thinking about how do we free up some more capital so that we can help teams get together um, in person uh, upon request. So that is still, I would say, one of our biggest challenges and work ahead of us. And then I think the third one, too, is it's just this ongoing challenge is, is thinking about, you know, every single opportunity and, and helping no matter where Boxer is, again, whether you're hybrid or remote, that feeling part of and that you can see yourself and you're feeling included, because again, that sense of inclusion, yeah. that sense of belonging um, is incredibly important in all that we do. Totally agree. Brandon, how about you? What is top just, of mind? I'll, I'll build on that. Um, I'll, I'll, and I got a second quick one I'll share after that, because we're talking about bringing folks together and what have you. Um, you know, Zapier may be all remote, but like Jess was saying, in-person connection still really matters uh, for this team too. And so we've had a tradition from the early days of bringing the whole company together from all over the world for, an, for a whole week. Uh, every single year. And we still we still do that. It's a massive investment of, of um, financial resources, it's also a massive investment of time, and it's totally worth it. So we've continued that, um, you know, beyond the pandemic. Uh, one thing we're working on within the kind of in-person connectivity strategy, though, is what are the times and places? So it's exactly the same question that Jess and the team are working through at Box. We're thinking about that, too. And one thing we've already adapted is that we used to um, have a more like functionally driven in-person event strategy. So we would do the all company event. Awesome, that's easy because everyone's invited, right? But then the question is, what do you do in between? And so we used to do more functionally. So like the engineering team would do an offsite for itself and, and the finance team would do an offsite for itself and so on. Um, we have evolved to more of a like how the work gets done model because it, you know as Zapier's gotten bigger, like some of them, almost all of the most important work that's happening at the company that's related to us delivering for our customers is happening in a highly cross-functional way. And so now mm -hmm. we're pointing a lot of our in-person event dollars is towards these very targeted cross-functional kind of work to be done type of events. So it's like if we're standing up a new team of designers, engineers, product people, and maybe a biz ops person to stand up a new product, if that team needs to get together for one week or two weeks, you know, and lock themselves in a room, um, you know, to, to figure out how to get started, that's a that's a check we're going to write. Um, and we're doing, and, and then in contrast, we're doing like many few, almost none now of these like purely functional driven offsets. Amazing. And just is it the same in box in terms of whether this is functional or cross-functional? What is the strategy of bringing people together? I think this is a very, very interesting topic because we see that this also varies a lot. Yeah, it completely agree that we have not yet um, brought the whole company together post pandemic. So that is something we're debating. Uh, we've also been debating, do we bring all of our leaders together? We have what we call Box Leaders Day on an annual basis. Historically, that was in person. We have not yet done that in person, but that's something that we're thinking about. Uh, we do have some teams that come together, but I to totally agree with what Brandon said. It's the cross-functional team. It's not just your reporting structure. It's who you work with. And so when we think about teams, we really try and think about, you know, again, don't think reporting lines, think about how when the work gets done mm -hmm. to bring people together. But, you know, for example, we had the super wonderful, um, super lucky to get my team together a couple, about a month ago. It was incredible, right? It was so wonderful to be able to bring people together. And just again, the stories, the inside jokes, the laughing, right? It's just, it, it just filled my soul in so many ways. And then I think it helped then kind of build, you know, the reserves or having then some of the tough conversations and really digging into uh, some of the more challenging aspects of business. So again, I think what Brandon said to build on that of being really intentional about those moments and when and how that in intentionality, I would say intentionality and flexibility are probably two of my favorite words throughout this whole uh, experience. <laughs> uh, this, this is great. Um, last question to both of you. Um, what would be your prediction uh, of what we'll see, you know, CPOs have to deal with when they consider or think about workplace in 2024 onwards? Who wants to start? It's a big question. 
I've got, I've got a quick one, um, Lisa. Um, you know, it, what what I think we're starting to see for many companies is that the the stated workplace policy and the lived workplace behaviors are in a lot of for a lot of companies are misaligned. They're not they're not there's a huge gap, right? So a company might say we want people back in the office five days a week, and then you say, well, what proportion of the company is coming in? You know, uh, even even two or three days a week, much less all five days. And there's there's typically a pretty significant gap. And so I think the big challenge here is just alignment. It's like at the end of the day. Um, you know, you, you need to connect your workplace policy to what you think is going to enable the company to be most successful. And then you need to make sure that folks align to that. And this is a good challenge for management. This is where like, if management has an inclination to a policy, it's like, we need people on five days a week. And it's not deeply connected to what the company needs to be successful. It gets really difficult to back it up if folks don't actually adhere to it. And so I think this is going to be a big it's already a wrestling match between management and their broader workforce at a lot of companies. And I think the most important thing is just to be clear, to be consistent, and then, you know, in that align. And if you find that like your workforce will not align to your state of policy, something's got to give, right? You need to make changes in your workforce, which is like not the thing I would recommend. The thing I would actually recommend is like, you know, listen and learn and think about your policy and, and just triple check whether that's the very best or only way uh, to enable your company to be successful. I couldn't agree more. Um, Jess, what do you think? Yeah, uh, the first actually thing that I thought was the first chart that you put on of the spectrum. I think spectrum. what I loved about, you know, I think one of the silver lines, linings of the pandemic is I think it just kind of opened up our perspective and that paradigm of it didn't have to be right fully in person five days a week and that's the only model or fully remote. And so I love that I think there's just going to be more companies across that spectrum and figuring out, again, what is the business model? What are the business needs? How do we address some of the challenges, right? I think about, you know, even for Boss, like, you know, one of my favorite events of the year is we have an annual what we call Global Impact Day. It's where we all take one day where we volunteer and give back. And we do it a lot throughout the year as well. But that is like our one day. But again, I think some of it's in person, some of it's hybrid, we have some all company, right, we have a session where the whole company comes together virtually, but then you can build teams. I think it's a great like micro example of I think it's just going to be we are I think at box going to continue to be on the spectrum, and then just continue to figure out, you know, along that those lines of intentionality, flexibility, um, how do we continue to help box thrive as an organization, but also every single boxer uh, be able to thrive creating that community and connection together. And I think uh, maybe uh, to back on that, maybe what would be your, you know, each of you, what advice you would give our uh, listeners about workplace strategy and in general employee engagement? Uh, I have a hunch, but wanted to, to hear your thoughts. Um, Jess, we'll start with you. Yeah, I think just to reiterate what I've said is, uh, one size does not fit all, right? And so really being thoughtful about what is the business strategy, what is the culture, what is the um, the intention that you want to create, and and then being willing to iterate and adjust and evolve along the way. With flexibility and transparency. With flexibility and intentionality, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I'll talk about a Brandon, message. You? Oh, I mean, truth be yeah. told, just said it best. I just co-signed what she said. Love it. <laughs> uh, amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you, amazing uh, speakers. Um, I love it. Um, thank you all. We'll continue to our second part of our uh, of our webinar, which will be a product demo. So um, thank you, Jess and Brandon, for joining this morning, uh, afternoon for some, uh, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining again. I think time, spending this time with us today, engaging in the dialogue. Yeah. If you have feedback, comments, thoughts, want to hear from you. And again, just thank you, Liza, and the whole team um, for putting this on. Really appreciate it. Amazing. Last one. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Jess. <laughs>